Okay, I want to focus on one type of uh, genocide in particular and the torture that took place in Cambodia. And this relates to the reading um, in the excerpt about Journey to Freedom uh, by Hang Nyor, which was originally in the Reader's Digest and eventually became the basis of the movie The Killing Fields. And so, um, just to show you a couple of things here. Um, this particular um, genocide occurs in the 1970s from 75 to 79 and it happens at the end of the Vietnam War which is occurring right here on the right and this is the country of Cambodia um, and this is its place geographically and this is um, Hang Nhor who ends up coming to the United States and starring in the movie where he portrays him, uh, someone who's similar to himself in the movie, and I'll come back to that momentarily. All right, so let's just kind of give you a little bit of the background on what happened in Cambodia. Um, we have to go back to the 1950s. Uh, um, you know, after World War II, the the colonial um, experience in what is known as French Indochina. So this region of Asia is colonized by the French. Um, and so at one point um, we get involved, the United States, in the Vietnam War uh, after the French uh, lose a battle at Dien Bien Phu. And um, uh, that happens uh, in 1954. In 1953, Cambodia gains its independence from France and they are ruled by a hereditary ruler, Prince Norodom Sinonauk. Um, and he's a leader until 1955 when he abdicates the throne and says we're going to have elections and he uh, wins the election in 1955. Okay. Well, um, about this time, uh, what's going on in Vietnam is important because it impacts Cambodia to a certain extent. And so what you have in Vietnam is the North Vietnamese are being led by Ho Chi Minh and the VC in South Vietnam or the Viet Cong are being um, uh, have provisions provided to them through the Ho Chi Minh Trail which you can see goes um, into Cambodia as it moves southward in order to avoid the American military. All right so if you're the Cambodian prince down here your position is quite tenuous so you have pressure from the Vietnamese communists to not allow the United States to come through the country of Cambodia. And of course then you have pressure from the United States government that if you don't let us through we're going to suspend aid, for example. Uh, internally within Cambodia you had growing dissatisfaction from the well-educated, the left, the traditional left in societies with what was, with the leadership, okay, and um, you also had repression of the left by the military, particularly General Lon Nall. All right, so you have your traditional left-right um, dissatisfaction internally in Cambodia. All right, so again, this is a, a, a um, um, cartoon at the time that pretty much says that we need some money to, to back up Cambodia in order for them to uh, allow us really to go through their country with our um, or go into their country um, and try to help end the Ho Chi Minh Trail um, that was supplying the South Vietnamese. Well because of this activity you have the emergence of what is called the Khmer Rouge and the Khmer Rouge are the Cambodian communists um, and early on they're not really a serious threat um, compared to the, the, the communist in Vietnam, for example. So in 1969, the Khmer Rouge only had about 2,500 troops uh, that they could seriously count on. But as the Vietnam War uh, progressed and you had the U.S. bombings of Cambodia, the, the so-called secret bombings, the internal situation in Cambodia became quite dire. In 1970, you had a coup where the general Lon Nol um, overthrew the prince. Okay, so you have a kind of um, a right wing um, military leader overthrowing the duly elected prince, who was now the leader of uh, through elections, 
And this coup is immediately recognized by the United States government. And uh, General Lon Nall becomes a ally of the United States. Well, this obviously alienates the Vietnamese and um, disrupts what they're trying to do with, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so some of the fighting of the Vietnam War starts to spread into Cambodia. This is part of the secret war in Cambodia. The deposed prince then joins the Khmer Rouge, all right? And so the leader of the Khmer Rouge, um, because the prince was a mere figurehead, is this individual who we become, who, who we know as Pol Pot. His real name is Salaf Sar, but he took on the name of Pol Pot. He opposes the United States. He opposes the U.S. Um, presence in South Vietnam. So he's opposed to the South Vietnamese government. So he allies himself with the northern, uh, with North Vietnam and helps to supply the VC in South Vietnam. And so in a mere several years, the Khmer Rouge has now had uh, 50,000 soldiers as part of that movement. All right. Uh, when the United States and the Vietnamese uh, enter into a peace accord, the Khmer Rouge feels betrayed by North Vietnam. They feel like they've been left out in the cold. And while this is going on, the U.S. aircraft are diverted to Cambodia to then um, try to get rid of Pol Pot. Um, so the Khmer Rouge turns on Vietnam, um, but there's also problems within the Khmer Rouge themselves. It's full of corruption. The country begins to spiral into disarray, and then you have an, an increase in human rights violations. And what makes the situation in um, Cambodia is so different than other revolutions of its time, and this genocide is so different, is the extreme nature of what the Khmer Rouge um, started to engage in, in terms of what it did to the country's economic viability. All right, well, <clears throat> the U.S. evacuates in 1975 um, out of Cambodia, and the Khmer Rouge arrive in the capital about five days later. Um, and so this is really a just a kind of a thing to think about. Is there to be peace with the United States out of Vietnam and Southeast Asia? And so, you know, the United States is not just leaving um, uh, Vietnam, but they're kind of just leaving all of the problems of Southeast Asia behind. And this leads to the Khmer Rouge, what are called pogroms. This is very analogous to the, um, the pogroms that were going on in Eastern Europe uh, during the Holocaust. And basically what the Khmer Rouge did was um, really start to make war, if you will, on modernity. Anything that was considered modern, markets, education, ed technological advancements, were, um, were destroyed. And basically the Khmer Rouge took Cambodia back to an agrarian lifestyle and evacuated everyone from the cities. You also had the Khmer Rouge increasingly being led by younger people, even children. Um, and so you have, um, you know, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds wielding AK, um, um, well, whatever weapons they had um, against this whole population and kind of indoctrination of youth into this, the child soldier mentality. So they engaged in what is called the eight-point program. And the idea was to uh, evacuate all the towns. We're not going to have a market anymore. We're not going to deal with free enterprise, if you will. We're getting rid of the regime currency. We're going to get rid of all the monks. We're not going to have religion, and we're going to make them work out in the, that should be rice paddies. This is a typo. Um, we're going to execute all the leaders of the Lan Nol regime um, who betrayed us. Um, if you're uh, one of the Khmer Rouge, um, you're going to establish these cooperatives throughout the country. So you're going to have communal living, okay? And you're going to expel the entire Vietnamese minority population because, after all, Vietnam um, um, betrayed um, Cambodia when they started the peace accords with the United States. And we're going to close down the borders. So they dispatched troops to the borders, particularly the Vietnamese border. So you basically have, in the late 1970s, a country that really kind of bombards itself back to the Stone Age. All the towns were uh, destroyed. 
You had no way of free enterprise, no commerce. It's all communal lifestyle. And your leadership is really a lot of young individuals um, who are indoctrinated into this um, society with communal lifestyle, a cooperative. Okay, no one goes in, no one goes out. Okay. So this is portrayed in the movie called The Killing Fields. And what you have is a, uh, Americans and, and other Europeans in Cambodia when it falls to the Khmer Rouge. And so at this point, a, a writer for the New York Times, Sidney Schoenberg, is aided by uh, a gentleman called Dith Pran, who is his guide in, uh, and is a journalist himself. In the movie, um, Sam Waterston, our friend from Law and Order, um, portrays Sidney Schomburg and Hang Nuor, who is the author of the piece you're reading in your reader about Journey to Freedom, he eventually, um, his life experience that you read about, he, he, he eventually winds up in the United States as a refugee and becomes an actor and portrays Dith Prawn in the movie The Killing Fields. And I will tell you, as a sad note to the end of Hang Noor's life, he is killed in a drive-by shooting in Los Angeles after he wins an Academy Award for his portrayal of Death Prawn. Okay, so I highly recommend renting this movie. I've tried to, I usually show it when I have this class uh, in a traditional format. The Killing Fields is not available on Netflix, so um, there might be another way to try and. Um, view this movie perhaps through uh, some other type of online delivery of movies. All right, so anyway, um, this is the portrayal of what happens during um, the Khmer Rouge um, leadership. All right, so who's at risk to be tortured or otherwise killed in, in the genocide that goes on um, uh, in Cambodia. So these are the groups at risk. And think about who were the groups at risk in the German Holocaust, all right? Well, college students, anyone who's educated, that includes teachers, is, is at risk um, for um, the genocide in Cambodia. Obviously, Jewish college students and Jewish teachers are at risk in the, in the Holocaust. Doctors, only 40 survived of the 270 who remained in Cambodia in 1975. So basically anybody that was part of the intelligentsia, anybody that was part of the intellectual left was going to, uh, or the intellectuals was going to be um, eliminated. If you were a civil servant, you worked for the government. If you were an ethnic minority, um, the Khmer Rouge executed 100,000 ethnic Vietnamese and then some ethnic Chinese, about a quarter million of them, um, were um, left to starvation and execution and died of, of diseases. All right, so how did these indi individuals die? Um, and this is what this term killing fields means, that they're really taken out into the fields, worked to death at one point, but then they're often suffocated with plastic bags out in the fields. There are public executions after public executions where you have individuals who are beaten to death, they're disemboweled, um, getting really kind of down to the gross nitty-gritty, um, this disembowelment led to parts of these individuals being cooked and eaten. Um, infants were killed quite regularly um, in very um, um, horrific manner. Um, and many of these individuals died in prisons around Cambodia, and, and Tuol Sling Prison is one example of uh, a prison where torture and interrogation took place. Um, there was about 14,000 individuals imprisoned uh, by January of 1979. This is getting toward the end of the Khmer Rouge. Um, only about 200 people were known to have survived this particular prison. So I just want to show you a very brief um, video about um, the particular events. Thirty years ago, guards dragged Chung Mei by the ear into a tiny cell in Cambodia's Tolsling prison. Khmer Rouge guards accused him of being a CIA and KGB agent. They beat him, electrocuted him, and pulled his toenails out. He lived in fear of death during his three-month detention. At midnight, they would come to take us away. If they didn't call out our name, we survived to live another day. 
At least 12,000 people were tortured here in the late 1970s and later executed just outside the capital, Phnom Penh. Less than 200 are believed to have survived. Only those with special skills were spared. Ney was a mechanic. As for Bu Meng, he was an artist. He was kept shackled for a year as he painted portraits of Khmer Rouge leader Pol Pot on the orders of prison chief Deutsch. The picture that I drew of Pol Pot saved my life. Deutsch told me to paint it. The resemblance was so lifelike that he decided to keep me alive for a while to use me. But in their minds, they were always going to kill me later on. Life was also hard for the guards. The paranoid regime arrested its own. Tos Leng held mostly Khmer Rouge members. Kyu Po was just 15 when he was set to work there. Two of his friends were first guards, then prisoners and ultimately victims. I lived in constant fear. I almost lost my spirit. I was powerless to do anything. Thirty years on, prison chief Gang Get Yu, better known as Deutsch, is finally facing trial for these atrocities. Other prison chiefs still roam free. There's 198 prison across the country at that time. Those lines just one of them. And other prison, it's horrible. No proper roof. Uh, no uh, medical units. Torsling survivors can at last hope for some form of closure. For relatives of the estimated 1.7 million people who died in Cambodia's nationwide genocide, the long wait for justice goes on. Okay, that 1.7 million people who died, some uh, estimates is up to 2 million represents between 15 and 20 percent of the entire population. And there's one article um, that describes what happened in Cambodia and describes it as the unique revolution. It really talks about how literally overnight entire cities were emptied, it says. Property was abolished. Money became worthless. Home and families were destroyed. Every aspect of human life was suddenly dictated by the new government. There was no transition period. Hundreds of thousands of people, store clerks, factory workers, taxi drivers, cooks, suddenly became farmers. Thousands were immediately executed. Overnight, Cambodia became a nation of slaves. And so while this particular revolution may not have been no morally worse than others, what makes it unique is that, as this article points out, is that not only was it astound astonishingly brutal, but was astonishingly stupid. For the most tar part, they, they talk about dictators want some things to, re to remain, some element of the state to, um, to remain so that they can stay in power, but everything was destroyed. And so the society basically grounded to a halt and ceased to a function. And so at some point, there is no governance occurring and it's really um, um, a primitive society once again. And as we learned last time, it's really the Vietnamese that intervene when we talked about humanitarian intervention in Module 3, um, well, a couple of modules ago, it's, it's the Vietnamese that step in because of the refugee flow into Vietnam of Cambodians, um, that they step in and really put an end to the Khmer Rouge. All right, so some other graphic pictures um, show you some of the mass graves that were found of, of the killing fields, um, uh, some additional photos of just the, the, the millions of people who were uh, killed in Vietnam. Um, again, Pol Pot's the leader, um, and this is uh, a museum that used to be a prison and torture center during Pol Pot's regime. Pol Pot dies. Um, um, uh, in the 1980s, um, and this is a cartoon um, that really kind of tries to encapsulize his legacy, if you will. There are several um, programs um, going on right now uh, to deal with Cambodian genocide. And so Yale has a um, website that you can go to to look at what's happening with the tribunal um, and again, this is one of those uh, war crimes tribunals that's really having a hard time getting going. There's no money for it. There is not a whole lot of people around to testify. It's been, um, you know, 30, 40, uh, 30 years since this particular event. 
and so it's it's becoming very difficult to um, um, bring anybody to justice. And here is that Comrade Deutsch that the the the, the um, video was talking about. So you can um, look at all of this Cambodian genocide program that they have have at Yale. Uh, in addition, um, the Global Policy Organization has a, um, um, uh, a whole section on international justice, so they look at several different types of international cr tribunals. So you can see here that we have talked a lot about the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. There's one for Rwanda. There's a special court for Sierra Leone and a special tribunal here for Cambodia as well as some others. And so this is what the UN is, is attempting to do about the Cambodian tribunal. Um, and then lastly, um, the Washington College of Law has some information about war crimes. They have a research office and so they are looking at um, um, who they're trying to, to bring to bear as people they want to prosecute for the accountability of the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. And so it's very slow going and, and again it's one of the problems with transnational justice is the amount of time it takes to get some type of justice and the amount of money and expertise it requires. Um, and so I don't think there's um, um, a lot of people who have the same types of hope for the Cambodian genocide uh, tribunal as they do for the former Yugoslavia. All right, uh, another cartoon about the death of Pol Pot. Uh, and again, you can just see the masses um, that are involved in that particular um, uh, genocide. All right, one thing that you might be asked to do is compare the genocides um, between Germany and Cambodia. So what are your general impressions? Can you draw any conclusions regarding why regimes commit human rights violations? So why did Germany go down this path? Why does Cambodia go down the path? Look at the readings, look at what I've talked about in the lectures and draw some conclusions about why these regimes are doing this. Secondly, who are the victims and why are these individual victims? And then lastly, how did they carry out these particular regimes? Is it done in secret? But yeah, how do you keep it a secret? Um, and again, this is a repeat of a previous slide. The state has to control many elements of what's going on in the state in order for a widespread genocide to be uh, successful, if you will. All right. And then think about, can we draw any conclusions about the characteristics conducive to human rights violations? Um, in the, uh, I guess you call it pre-lecture, if you will, when I talked about um, international relations theory, I talked about how we go about studying human rights and in, in international relations, and we can think about levels of analysis. So if we wanted to just look at the individual level of analysis, we can talk about the dehumanization of the enemy. What happens to the victims? They're dehumanized. Their humanity is really stripped from them. And why are they the targets? And some people point to this relative deprivation theory, particularly in the Jewish case in the Holocaust, about how others are looking to be relatively deprived and seek some sort of scapegoat for their current conditions. At the nation state level, we can look at issues of nationalism. What role did nationalism play in Germany's path toward the Holocaust? What role did nationalism play in the Khmer Rouge evolution? What about poverty and economic issues? Um, ideology, the left versus the right, the communist versus the more fascist regimes. So regime type might make a difference. At the international level of analysis, we can look at what's happening in terms of the balance of power and the international system from the German case. Um, and they wanted to um, regain power after the Treaty of Versailles and what happened to them with war reparations from World War I. And then we can look at imperialism, dependency theory, this kind of Marxist view about the Cambodian case. So kind of think about those kinds of things if you're trying to explain why a genocide might occur. Okay. We're going to stop there um, with our discussion of Cambodia so that you can think about how that might compare to the German case that I mentioned in the first lecture. And then this next lecture, we'll look at a couple of other cases um, uh, of, of torture and, and genocide um, in a couple of other countries um, so that you can see how they are either alike or different than the Cambodian and German case.